Hi everyone, my name is Sheila and I am a Children and Youth Services Librarian at Vancouver Island Regional Library and I'm back with you today for another bonus special weekly event. Uh, first off, I would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Indigenous peoples of each of the communities in our service area and represented by those in attendance at today's virtual program. I am coming to you today from the unceded territory of the Snanamo people whose historical relationship with the land continues to this day. So welcome to our latest special Summer Reading Club virtual event. Our special guests today are the super-powered father-daughter duo, Jeremy and Hermione Tankard. Jeremy is the best-selling author and illustrator of several picture books for young children, most famously the Grumpy Bird series, which you may know. Um, York and Bones is Jeremy's first graphic novel, and this fulfills a lifelong dream of his of making comic books. Uh, Jeremy's co-author, Hermione, uh, has helped her dad to create this new Shakespearean adventure by taking his finished story and rewriting it into Shakespearean iambic pentameter, which is an impressive feat, and she has added her own flourishes to the story in the process. So, Please join me in welcoming Jeremy and Hermione as they talk about their new book, Yorick and Bones, the writing process, and demonstrate some drawing for us. Hi, everyone. Hello. I'm Jeremy Tankard, and this is my daughter, Hermione Tankard. And we are here today to talk to you a little bit about our new book, Yorick and Bones. And share some anecdotes and stories with you, maybe answer some questions. Hopefully we'll answer the questions in the presentation. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit about us, I guess. I am a picture book author, best known for Grumpy Bird. Can you pass me Grumpy Bird, please, Hermione? Grumpy Bird, there we go. That's my best known book. Um, Hold that, please. Okay. So there are other Grumpy Bird books in the series. There's four of them. Sleepy Bird is the most recent one. Um, I've also done books with other authors, including It's a Tiger by David La Rochelle. And this wonderful book, Piggy Bunny, which I did with Rachel Vale. She wrote it, I illustrated it. Um, Here Comes Destructosaurus by Aaron Reynolds. The pictures by me, and there's Me Hungry. It was one of my earlier books. In fact, this is my second book. It's about a hungry cave boy. Um, oh, and there's Boo Hoo Bird. That was my third book. Um, so yeah, I've mostly worked on books for younger children, picture books. Uh, so Yorick and Bones, which I just dropped on the floor, is my very first graphic novel. So that's a little bit about me. Um, we live in the wonderful city of Vancouver, here on the west coast. Hermione, who are you? You should pick up York and Maybe Bones. Maybe I should pick up York and Bones. Um, hi, I'm Hermione. I'm his daughter. Um, I did the. I wrote the words of York and Bones, but not the story. Um, and I, I'm 18. And I'm currently a university student studying music, um, but I'm just really into art, and, or like arts and writing and stuff in general. Um, and I like writing things in verse, which is what York and Bones is. So that means like it has a certain rhythm to it, which for me is really exciting because it's like music, but with words. Mm -hmm. So that's what, that's what I do. So Hermione, um... What kind of music are you studying? Um, I'm studying classical voice. Um, so I'm a singer and I sing, I mean, all kinds of classical music. Um, I'm hoping to eventually sing opera, but who knows? Um, yeah, who knows? She's really good. He has to say that because he's my dad. <laughs> I don't have to say that. Um, yeah, Hermione's got a really huge voice, so um, I would ask her to sing, but this close, it would blast out my eardrums. <laughs> it's not true. Um, it, it, but it's very loud. It's very loud. 
Um, okay, so what else about us? Hermione, what is your favorite color? Uh, pink? Okay. Probably. Maybe red. I don't know. What's your favorite color? My favorite color is a kind of a limey shade of green. Uh, do we have any house pets? We do. We have a cat. She's very fluffy. Her name is Pascal. Uh, I'm a big fan of our cat. Yeah. And, and, and they just else? got a dog while I was away <laughs> to replace me. And I'm not a fan of dogs, so I don't like it very much. But it's it's a very nice dog. <laughs> we just don't get along. <laughs> well, you don't not get along either. Mm, he loves me. It's not really mutual. <laughs> the dog's name is Gibson, and he's really cute, but he's not home he's, right now. He is very cute. He's out for a walk and a grooming, I believe. Um, all right, so the story of York and Bones that we're here to talk about is kind of a it's kind of a weird journey, actually, because yes. Hermione, did you ever want to be a published author? No, that was never part of my life plan. <laughs> Um, so how is it that you find yourself with your name on the front cover of a book? Um, well, it was very exciting and very unexpected. Um, basically, I was in a waiting room when I was 14. Um, what kind of a waiting room? Like a doctor? A, no, it was, um, it was a dance studio. Um, and I had gotten there like an hour and a half early because of the bus. Um, which, you know, better to be early than late, I guess. Yep. Um, and I had just discovered um, uh, kind of how to write in iambic pentameter because I had learned that that's the meter Shakespeare used and I was really, really into Shakespeare. Um, and I had just read these books. They're like um, Star Wars, but written in Shakespearean language. And I was like, that's so cool. So, and I decided to do that to my dad's book, Grumpy Bird, because I thought he would like it and I thought he would think it was funny. So I did that. I wrote it. Um, I wrote Grumpy Bird into iambic pentameter um, when I was in that waiting room. And it took me a couple days because I kept getting there like an hour early. And so I would just like over several days just kept writing it longer and longer until it became Grumpy Bird, but as a very, very short two-act Shakespearean comedy. Um, or melodrama. Melodrama, I guess, yeah. is probably the right word. Um, and yeah, it was uh, very fun to write, and I showed it to my dad, and he didn't seem to get the joke, because I was like, ah, look what I wrote. Isn't this hilarious? And he was like, this is so cool. I'm showing it to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. And it's because it was a good joke. Thank one, you. One likes to share a good joke. Um, and so he showed it to his agent to be like, haha, look what my daughter wrote. And she was like, you should get her to rewrite Yorick and Bones. And that's what happens. And then we got a book deal, which is really exciting. That's and it exciting. was really cool to get to work with my dad on a project. Well, I am cool to work with. Yes, if I do you very so much myself. are. Um, I actually know the thrill was more for me because I got to collaborate with my daughter, which was also not exactly a career aspiration, but uh, kind of a really cool thing that yeah. I dropped in my lap. All right, Hermione, are you ready to read Grumpy Bird? I sure am. As a Shakespearean tragedy. It's not a tragedy, but yes. <laughs> comedy, tragic comedy. All right, act one, scene one. Bird is lying center stage. He awakes. I have awoke in not a merry way, and so this day not merry shall I be. I cannot eat. I cannot play. Alas, I cannot even use my wings today. Condemned to spend my day upon the ground, I angrily shall walk my dreary way. Yet here's sheep. Sheep. Why, hello, bird. How grumpy thou dost look. Pray, what's this weary business that you do? I walk. And yet thou hast no company. 
Hast ever thou considered a friend? Indeed, I would be glad to walk with you, if thou dost think thou wouldst my presence like. Scene two, bird and sheep walk, enter rabbit. There be rabbit, says sheep. Rabbit, my greetings, bird, prithee, what dost thou do? I walk, and yet no pleasure does it bring. Rabbit, some exercise forsooth is overdue. My form is not the way twas once beheld. I'll leave this carrot here upon the ground and walk along with you where'er you go. Scene three, they walk, enter, raccoon. Rabbit, here be our dear friend raccoon. Raccoon, oh bird, my friend, what dost thou over here? I walk, thou knave, or dost thou not perceive? Ah, oh, it does seem to be a simple way to yet amuse one's mind, and even still, to have a good time with one's closest friends. Be not afraid of loneliness, I come. Scene four. They walk. Enter Beaver. Raccoon. Ah, oh, yet there's Beaver. Beaver. Why, hello, bird. Oh, my, what dost thou do? If thou art sure that thou canst not this see, a clue I now shall give unto thy mind. The deed is done by placing of thy feet, one in front of other, many times. Beaver. Dost thou speak of walking? My, what fun! Walking is quite great love of mine. Scene five. They walk. Enter Fox. Beaver. Yet there lies the cave of our friend Fox. Fox. Good day, bird. Oh, pray, what do you do? I cannot understand why one can't see the tiresome activity I do. Indeed, if now thine eye does not perceive, I may suggest that maybe you be blind. My mood since I awoke has been quite low. I leave it up to you to make it worse. Thy questions are so tiresome and so dull. I prithee all to leave me quite alone. All day the same, ye all have posed to me this question, this same question every time. And now it bores me so to the extreme. Who are you, all you imbeciles I hate? Who are you that can so irritate? Oh, that you can so irritate? I wish for all thy lives to go to waste. This one last time I'll answer thy request. I walk. Yes, this is all. In truth, I walk. Act two, scene one. Bird stands to side. Others are center stage. Sheep. Please listen, all you friends of me and Bird. You've noticed surely how he does look sad and angry. Grumpy, even I would say. There must be some way we can help our friend. A game, a book, a toy. What do ye think? I've no ideas. Pray, hast any ideas? Raccoon. I know not any ways to cure a mood. Beaver. Mm, nor I, although tis something I should learn. Fox. A book, perhaps? I have one in my cave. Rabbit. Be quiet, all. I have idea formed. A game we'll play, and this will cheer him up. We'll copy every little thing he does. No matter what, be sure, make no mistake. Scene two. Do ye come? Others. Do ye come? They all walk on the spot. Alas, my legs grow weary. Now I stop. Alas, my legs grow weary. Now I stop. All stop. Bird experimenting stands on one leg. Others do the same. They copy all I do. I ask me, why? Bird jumps. Others jump. Scene three. I find this rather fun, this child's game. Indeed, you all do entertain me so. In fact, I must now wonder if ye planned this folly-filled adventure all for me. 
When I awoke this day, it seemed so grim, but now have my emotions all gone light because of what ye all have done for me. I can be merry and my life enjoy. I do invite ye all unto my nest. A snack we soon may eat if now we fly. Others. A snack? Oh, what fun. Oh, we shall have a feast. They fly to bird's nest. Now may I please present ye all this snack, which we may hap did mention time gone by. This good worm did I find upon the ground, and now its flesh we merrily may eat. Sheep. But yet a worm? Oh, whoa, what have I done? The end. And that is Grumpy Bird as a Shakespearean play in two acts. And this right here is a picture of a skeleton and a dog. And I actually drew this when I was seven years old. Um, it's in a little book called The Book of Stories, which is had a couple of actual stories in it, but mostly it was a 64 page collection of silly drawings. Um, so this is one of my favorite ones, picture of a skeleton. He's screaming, help, because a little dog is coming up to him. As we all know, Hermione, what do dogs like to eat? Bones. Bones. They don't actually like to eat people, as far as I know, but they like eating bones. Um, and the skeleton is made of... Bones? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, so actually, the funny thing was, like, I used to do a lot of school presentations where I'd talk to kids about... Uh, my career, and there was one afternoon where I was showing this picture of the skeleton and the dog, and I totally blanked. Like, I'd given this presentation so many times, but this picture came up on the screen, and I forgot what I was talking about. And I suddenly realized, ah, oh, there's a really fun story here that I could tell about a skeleton and a dog who become really good friends. But the dog just wants to eat him, and the skeleton doesn't want to be eaten. So how is this friendship going to work? Um, so that was actually where York and Bones all started, which was 40 years ago. I'm 47 years old, in case you're having trouble with the math. Um, but so fast forward a few years to York and Bones that we're talking to you about. So I had this picture book that I've been working on called Scully and Bones, which was about a skeleton and a dog. Um, but basically, I wrote it as a picture book, my agent pitched it, and basically it was about a skeleton who gets dismembered by a small animal and then buried in different places, and he has to figure out how to get dug up again. And the publisher wrote back and said, this story's really dark for a picture book for children. We don't normally do picture books about um, the main character getting taken apart and buried. So, uh... Maybe there's something here that I like, so maybe try it again. <laughs> so I wrote and wrote and rewrote this picture book for years, trying to find the right tone where it was still kind of dark, but not that kind of dark. Mm -hmm. But at a certain point, Holly, who's uh, my agent, said, have you ever thought of doing this as a graphic novel? Because I know you love comics. And it's kind of odd that I hadn't thought of that, but I started rewriting it as a graphic novel, and that also took years. I think I, I, I did hundreds of pages of art trying to figure out what the story was about and how it worked. And every time I'd turn in a new draft, Holly would say, you know what, Jeremy, this story is really great. I love what's going on here, but the voice is just wrong. There's just something doesn't sit right with me. But then, um, you remember in the introduction, Hermione talked about rewriting Grumpy Bird. And then I showed it to Holly, uh, at which point she thought that maybe I should let Hermione just try rewriting this graphic novel that I'd been working on called Scully and Bones. Because maybe all it needed was to be rewritten or translated, really, from regular English that I was writing into Shakespearean iambic pentameter. So that's all she did was basically translate it, except there was more than a translation, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, I I kind of, like, added a lot, and, like, there were things... It, it changed, like, 
some things became more important, some things became less important, so... But the story is the same, the, and like yeah. the format is very much the same, so... Yeah, so it's... it's it is a translation. It's my story, but Hermione really gave voice to the main character, and... It's kind of a funny collaboration because that character became more than mine in the process, even though I kind of planned out the whole story and already written it. Um, because Hermione's translation was so much more than just a translation, it kind of became a true collaboration in the end, which was really fun for me. And I was surprised seeing just how much it changed. And like I had written things that I thought were funny and in iambic pentameter, they were way funnier. But then I had other scenes that I didn't think were really funny. But when you rewrote them, they became, some of them became hysterically funny. And when I was drawing it, were some of the most fun things to illustrate in the book. It's the, the absurdity of yes. the character in the modern world, just randomly speaking like a Shakespeare character. Exactly. So we changed the name from Scully to Yorick. Why did we do that? Uh, Yorick is the only skull who has a name in a Shakespeare play. Um, in, the, in the play Hamlet, um, Hamlet has the skull of one of his childhood friends. Yeah. Um, and he holds it up and says, alas, poor Yorick, and then a whole, a whole speech. Um, yeah. yeah. So the really fun thing for us was when we put this all into iambic pentameter, we thought, oh, we have to change his name. His name has to be Yorick, mm -hmm. because he's the only skull in a Shakespeare play. And it would be really funny because Hamlet is about, I don't know if it's the darkest tragedy, but it's no, a really, it's really sad, tragic tale. So that we thought it would be really funny to kind of take this really sad story and take an idea from it, not so much a character, because Yorick isn't really a no. character, but he's talked about in the play, mm -hmm. and kind of reimagine Yorick in a really funny kid's book where instead of his best friend, childhood friend, holding his skull and talking to him, um, we just have a small dog dig him up and who wants to eat him. Mm -hmm. And he's this kind of like ridiculous, like, character, he's a little awkward, yeah. You no, know, I I think he's very different than, um, than the mood of Hamlet in general. <laughs> About as different as it could yeah. possibly be. <clears throat> okay, York and Bones, Act One, Love Bites. Page. Grumble, grumble. Oh, so tired. Ah, well, these hot dogs aren't gonna sell themselves. Grumble, grumble. Oof. Grumble, grumble. Seep, seep. Zing. Alas, once more, I would I were asleep. When e'er my eyes doth open, it is dark. It seems eternity that I have slept. So long I ne'er can recall my past. Oh, did I hide in jest and not be found? Or did I lie and sleep beneath cool shade? Nay, that can't be. For now I find I am all covered o'er with heavy, damp, dark soil. Forsooth, I hear no sound around me now. Although this may be as another day, yet nay, this surely is of consequence. For no worms do my sorry ears announce. Alack, there is but one thing I desire, a friend. A one with whom I may converse. A loyal beast or man with whom to share. A one with whom on long, cold nights I may find refuge in their warm, embracing arms. And yet, there is another dream I wish. A luxury beyond my mind's own lens. A sausage would true, unreal wonder bring, if I could this and a companion take. What sound is this? A beast? I cannot know. Tis louder than I've heard for ages past. Could it be that my prayers now granted be? All hail, noble creature, dost thou hear? 
Good man, good woman, good child, or good beast, please now deliver me from earth and jail. Tis from this place that I now call to thee. Come by this way, O hope, and free my bones. I must now wonder who this being be. A man? A woman? Mayhap a child? I hope that they be kind, polite, and good. What words then shall I speak? Nay, be they friend? Thou art nearing nigh, I well may say, O noble youth or elder, make thee haste. So Hermione, um, you talked in your introduction about music and rhythm and language. So you started reading Shakespeare when you were in grade four. Yes. Do you remember what the first Shakespeare you got was? Yes. The first Shakespeare play that I ever read was Romeo and Juliet. Um, because we were in a bookstore, we had spent like hours there and I was just, uh, my dad loves bookstores. It felt like hours. I was <laughs> nine. You loved bookstores too. I did. Um, but I was just kind of left to my own devices in the bookstore and there was this copy of Romeo and Juliet. It had a pink cover. And as we've said before, I love pink. Um, <laughs> And I was you must just, have heard of it before. Yeah, I've, of course, I had heard of it. Um, but I, I like was just drawn to it, and um, and I took it off the shelf, and I was like, this is so cool. I knew a little bit about the story, um, and so I kind of like I think I started flipping through it and reading the words, and I was like, this is so awesome, um, and I eventually convinced my dad to let me get the book. Yeah. I think you bought it for me. I, I think I had a moment of thinking, ugh, you're in grade four. This is a waste of money buying you a sh mm -hmm. Shakespeare book. Mm -hmm. But talked and immediately realized that that was dumb. If I have a, how are you in grade four? Eight, like or nine. eight or nine. If I have a nine year old who really wants to read Shakespeare, who am I to say no? That's awesome. Because I actually, I love Shakespeare. And when I was in high school, I did a, ton of like acting um and reading of Shakespeare yeah yeah uh, and then I think I think it took me a while to like really get into it I kept like starting to read it and then giving up but the summer after grade four I I think it took me two weeks to read the whole thing and obviously I didn't understand and everything but I I really got the story and I was like I I just I just fell in love with the language and the kind of the, the stories and the way it worked. Mm -hmm. There's good stories there. There are, yeah. And beautiful language. Yeah, and the language is always like what drew me to it. So what is iambic pentameter? Because we've mentioned before that York mm -hmm. and Bones is written in Shakespearean iambic pentameter. Mm -hmm. What is it? Iambic pentameter is the verse, the not the verse, the meter um, that Shakespeare uses in a lot of his plays and that a lot of other poets use too. It's not exclusive to Shakespeare. Um, and it's also not the only meter that Shakespeare used, but it's the one he uses the most often. And kind of how it works is that it's in this rhythm that has five iambs. So pentameter means five. And an iamb is kind of like a syllable that goes da da. So it's a weak beat and then a strong beat. So, two syllables. Yeah, two okay. syllables. Um, so each line of iambic pentameter has ten syllables, and the the rhythm kind of goes like da 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 da. -da, -da. It's kind of like a heartbeat, um, mm, in yeah. a way. And yeah, it's um, it's mostly what Shakespeare used. Sometimes his verses rhyme, sometimes they don't. Um, but a lot of his characters use iambic pentameter when they when they speak. Um, some of them don't, some of them use different meters or don't use any meter, but, um, definitely it's the one that most of his plays are written in and a lot of other poets, I can't think of any examples, but a lot of poets from Shakespeare's time use iambic pentameter as well. Um, and a lot of modern poets use it still. Um, so yeah. So Shakespearean iambic pentameter is iambic pentameter with other sort of antiquated words in it? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like old language, you know. Word like forsooth. Forsooth. Which means why? Is that right? Um, 
What does forsooth mean? You know, I know this, <laughs> but it's kind of just like forsooth something or other, blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> Very specific. <laughs> it, it's, it's like kind of an exclamation. Okay. I don't know. I could be wrong there. If you really want the answer, you might want to Google it. Maybe I should Google it because I use that word a lot. <laughs> Um, it's a good word, though. It is a very good word. It's a very Shakespearean kind yes. of word. Yes. Or also saying, like, alas, alack, that's very Shakespearean. Yeah. But it's it's the kind of language that he used. Although Shakespeare also, like, invented a lot of words as well. He invented hundreds of words. Yeah, like yeah. hundreds of words that we still use today. It was, so. it was kind of like the Dr. Seuss of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, not really. No, uh, he was. He, he came up with words all the time that now we use yes. a lot. Um, what's your favorite book? Of my books? Or of, uh, of all time? Both. Both. Okay. Uh, actually, you know what? We're sitting behind a bunch of, er, not behind, we're sitting in front of a bunch of books. So if you'll excuse me for one second. Thanks. Uh, my very favorite book is not actually a storybook. It's a collection of sketches by a very famous Japanese children's book illustrator named Chihiro Iwasaki, who died, I think, in 1973. But you probably can't see much in the camera here, but it's just a collection of pencil and sometimes ink drawings that she did. And I like these actually even more than I like her picture books that she did. So this is my favorite book, but if you want favorite author, um, Arnold Lobel, who wrote Frog and, Frog and Toad, which Hermione remembers because she had a lot of Frog and Toad read to her when she was very small. Yes. Do you like Frog and Toad? I do like Frog and Toad. So Arnold Lobel is my writing hero. I think he's an amazing writer. Um, of my books, I think they're all special in their own way. Um, I've often told kids that I don't have a favorite book because that would be like your mom having a favorite kid, which incidentally she does. I'm kidding. Um, oh, no. We like both. We love both of our kids equally. Um, Grumpy Bird is special because it was the first and it gave me a career that I didn't expect to have because I wasn't looking to be a writer. So I'm very grateful to Grumpy Bird. So for a long time, I said that one was my favorite, but I have to say uh, York and Bones is a dream come true project because it is a project that I always wanted to do. Ever since I was a little kid, I wanted to make comic books. So it's special because it's my first comic book. It's special because I got to collaborate with you. Um, it's special because I hope that it's the first of many graphic novels to come. Speaking of which, I have a question for you, Hermione. Yeah? Um, is there going to be another York and Bones? There is! We have a second <clears throat> one in the works. Um, I think you finished all the art for it already. No, I've only done the sketches. He's finished all the sketches yeah. for it, which is super exciting. Yep. Um, it's, been uh, written, it's been written. It's been written. Partially it's been, drawn. Yeah, it's been translated into iambic pentameter. Yeah. Um, I'm super excited it's about this. It's really one. fun. It's got a lot of cameos from other tragic Shakespearean characters, which was really fun to write. Yeah. And kind of fun for us both, I think, to revisit. It favorite Shakespeare yes. plays and think, oh, what can we do with this character? Hmm. Um, so that's kind of fun. What's your favorite book? In total? Yeah, well, um, ever. It's like ever? Do you, do you have a favorite book? I don't know if I have a favorite... Hmm. My favorite novel is 10 Things I Can See From Here by Carrie Mack. Um, Fun fact, Carrie Mack lives two blocks from our house. It's true, she does. She's our neighbor. Yes, and I only met her like a couple of months ago. Yes. Which was super exciting. I was like, oh my god, <laughs> she wrote my favorite book. Um, yeah, but she she wrote this book um, and it's it's about a girl with anxiety and I have anxiety. So 
you know, it's it's a very it's a very relatable book for me, and it's very comforting to me. It read. also happens in. East it also happens. Yes, it happens in our neighborhood. All the events of the book, which is fun to read about. Um, yeah. 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 I just I, it it's very much my one of my favorite books. I thought you were gonna say Pride and Prejudice. Pride I don't and Prejudice like is one. also a book that I'm a very big fan of. Yeah. I don't. Again, I don't have a favorite book. Yeah, there's lots of good books. Yes. It's hard to pick a favorite. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, those two are up there. Do you have a favorite opera? Because I know you're studying to be an opera singer. I don't know. Hmm. Do you have a favorite composer? I do. Um, my favorite composer is Tchaikovsky. Um, he wrote a lot of ballet music, and that's what he's most known for, but he also wrote some really, really beautiful music for voice, and I just, like, all his music has some really beautiful melodies and it always just makes me be like, oh, the art, it's the art. beauty. Drama. His yes. Music has oh, a lot it's of so drama. dramatic. It's good story music, actually. Mm -hmm. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I love about yeah. it. You can't go wrong with Tchaikovsky. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. For this next thing, I recorded a very short video of some of my drawing process. So when I'm drawing, York and Bones, I actually do all of my drawings first on paper, either with a pencil or with a pen. In this video, I used a pencil. I scan those drawings into my computer and then I finish them using a piece of software called Clip Studio Paint, which is a Japanese software designed for drawing manga or Japanese comics. So all of York and Bones is actually drawn with Clip Studio Paint. Um, and I chose to pre-record this just because the drawing took about 20 minutes and it's not the most exciting thing. Watch somebody draw for 20 minutes. So it's a time lapse. It speeds the whole 20 minutes up to about a minute and a half. <laughs> short studio tour, and because we're doing a video presentation, um, this is something I actually never get to do when I'm talking to people live or in schools, is uh, cut in a video a tour of where I work, because I often show photos of, of my studio, but I've never actually made a little video, so this is just for you. So when we enter my studio, the first thing we see is my scanner here. On a little table, there's a printer underneath it, a few odds and ends behind it, there's a special book of color swatches that I use when I'm coloring my art, there's my lucky four-leaf clover here on my desk, some speakers, I like listening to music while I work, um, this is my computer desk over here, um, on the right is a great big drawing tablet that I use when I'm drawing and coloring on the computer. 
on the left side is my, my Mac. It runs all my software. One of the most important things in my studio is right here. It's my mug of tea. I love drinking tea while I work. Um, I get quite a lot of light in my studio. On my windowsill here, I've got some little toys. A little, whole bunch of little monsters that live on my windowsill. There's a Lego haunted house that I got for my birthday a few years ago that I really like. If we zoom out here, we'll see in front of my computer desk is my comfortable red chair to sit on while I'm working. There's a heater. My studio can get quite cold in the winter time, especially, but even in the spring, like right now. There's a big poster on the wall that says, when I grow up, I'm gonna have x-ray vision and pants that make me fly. And opposite the computer desk is my drawing table right here. It's a standing desk, so it's quite tall. I like to stand up while I'm drawing sometimes. Sitting on the desk in the corner is a great big grumpy bird stuffy. He's sitting on a pile of file folders and sketchbooks. Below that is a pile of drawings on paper and one of my sketchbooks. There's a fresh off the press copy of York and Bones. There's my camera. Another smaller sketchbook there. Over here is a pile of other odds and ends. This right here is probably the most important thing in my studio, this little pencil case here. It's got my favorite drawing tools in it. Right here is a fountain pen that I bought in Japan a couple of years ago. It's my very favorite thing to draw with. I don't use it in my books, but I use it in my sketchbooks, which is actually where I do more drawing than anywhere else. The blue thing here is a, an eraser. No good with a fountain pen, but it's good with my pencil, which is right here. It's a mechanical pencil. And the final tool is a brush pen. And this actually is the tool I use for all of my picture books. And for a lot of fun drawing as well. If we zoom out again, we can see beside the desk is my guitar. There's a cabinet below the guitar, which is where I keep all of my art supplies. Here, let's open the drawer here so we can see what's in here. Lots of pens. Next one down is markers. Anyway, they all have art supplies in them. And on this wall over here is a, a lot of bookcases. The top shelf here is uh, my books, my picture books and other books I've worked on. And there's a lot of comic books and graphic novels. I have a lot of art books. I have a lot of picture books by other children's illustrators. And these big orange cabinets in the middle are also full of office supplies and art supplies. And as we zoom over there, that's the entrance. It's a little bit messy at the moment. And back around to my computer desk. All right, Hermione, I think that's it for our presentation to the Vancouver Island Regional Library. So thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Jeremy and Hermione. That was amazing. To those of you watching, please let them know how much you enjoyed their visit by commenting here below this video. And also we would love it if you would join us here on Tuesday, August 18th at 2 p.m to celebrate your summer reading club accomplishments with a big wrap up concert with Rick Scott. And if you haven't joined our summer reading club Facebook group, it's not too late. Kids are able to keep working on their reading through September this year because it's been a difficult year for everyone we know. So just head over to the kids page at virl.bc.ca and follow the summer reading club link to find out more. And we also want you to know that we do have more virtual programming planned for the fall. So keep an eye on the events page of our website. Thank you.